Hi guys, welcome back for episode number 26, which makes me realize that last week was one quarter of the way to 100 episodes. I've actually, you know, hit 100 one minute overview videos like within like didn't even take me a whole year I think of content creation to make 100 one minute overview videos but for these longer videos of course it's going to take a longer time so I guess it's more um, rewarding it will be more rewarding I guess once I hit episode 100 but anyway enough babbling so I played a couple of games and we've started to yet again have you know more game nights with people actually showing up so I did get in a couple of three and four player games not of the heavier ones but you know at least I was able to play some games that I can talk about at a higher player count. So the first game I want to talk about is A Pleasant Journey to Nico. Now this is a game that I bought used from Board Game Geek so let me just read the relevant information. This is a 2018 game um, for two to four players designed and illustrated by City Lo and the publisher is The Wood Games. So this says plan your ship's routes and spot the most penguins in the Antarctic. So I'm going to go a, you know a little bit more in depth on how to play this because someone on Instagram did mention that they um, haven't played their copy yet because they don't understand how to play so I thought I would do a little bit more of a thorough um, overview of how to play this game before I go into my thoughts on it. So in this game you are going to have one main board. So this game I played um, at a two-player count so but this is the main board and then each player will have their own personal player board and then depending on the number of players you're going to put in certain cards um, in the spots that you know equate to your number of players so I played a two-player game so we had a card here a card here a card here and here and here so we had a total of five cards um, this is a dice placement game so in some instances when you use your dice you are going to place them here after using them um, this just goes over the game flow there are some mid game and uh, end of game objectives that you can meet um, so the mid game objectives are revealed at, um, at the beginning and they are scored at the end of round two and then the end of game objectives are scored at the end of round four and they are special um, these certain tiles that and you can so you know you can turn them upside down and randomly pick those objectives and then here is the score tracker um, I did not play the advanced mode so with the advanced mode there are some other cards and I think maybe it increases the rounds I'm not 100% certain on that and here is an example of a player board so this just shows you um, so you'll be storing dice here that you will be drafting, which I'll be going over in a minute. Below your player board, you're going to be putting the cards that you acquire, and those cards create your shipping lane, basically. You'll have a harbor token, and for each harbor token you have, you can create multiple shipping lanes. Each player does start the game with one harbor and one ship, and the ship will be traveling along on the cards and this will show you what your free actions are available that you can take um, during each round and also the main actions that you are able to take um, and there are different kinds of resources in this game so let me just go over some of those so here are the harbor tokens um, just anchors um, and blue ships each player is going to have one penguin and the penguin is going to be your score marker and then fishies which are some resources that you can basically acquire so you can acquire fish and then sell them during the market phase at the beginning of each round or you can also do that as a free action um, during the main phase um, there's money of course um, all the dice and um, at the beginning of the game you can select a token which will give you some extra starting resources um, so there's you know four different tiles and each player would select one starting with player number four and going backwards to get their additional resources there is fuel fuel which you need to make your ship move forward and there are these goods tokens which i did not actually end up really using and then there are these tokens which certain cards require which will allow you to increase or decrease the value of a die so let me just pull out some cards so I think the reason that um, this game, the rule book might seem a little bit confusing at first glance for some people is the way it was written. So even the way it was written at first, I was like, oh my God, this is going to be so complicated. Like it kept on talking about, you know, how many um, 
like uh, segments there are in the game or phases and then rounds and then sections in each round and it just at the at the beginning it just seemed like it might be overwhelming to keep track of all of that but then i realized that you don't actually need to name each and every single thing so really it's just four rounds with you know different um um action not actions um different phases in each round so four rounds with just a couple of different phases in each round and that's it really um so you're going to have these cards that are laid out and you are going to be trying to form hubs on in your shipping lane so a hub is when you have two cards next to each other and that will give you an additional space where you might be able to place a die during your action phase to use that ability and there are different types of cards there are some cards which give you end of game abilities some card which get cards which give you a bonus a buying bonus so like for example if you have one of these colored cards then you can decrease the cost of a card that you buy by two coins um, there are cards which uh, here's an end of game bonus um, card for example so this says for every fish you have at the end of the game you will get one penguin point um, there are cards like this one which for the first one you get you will get two of those tokens that will allow you to increase or decrease the value of a die and then for the additional cards that will allow you to um, take I believe this one says uh, take a discarded die a die that has already been used by someone so you one of the um, things I did not like about this game is and I don't know how to fix this so all these dice are the same color so at the beginning of the game each player is going to take six dice and they're going to roll those dice and then you take turns drafting the dice so you're going to pick a die and then uh, you know without changing the values of the dice pass it along to the player to your left and then take a die from the dice that were handed over to you and again pass until everyone has six dice so you're not changing the values the reason that the colors are problematic is because during the main action phase one of the actions you can do is to bid on a card so all of these cards um, in order to acquire the cards on the main board, you need to bid on them. And you bid on them with values of your dice. Um, so that's one of the actions you can take, is you can take a die and put it on the card, and that shows that you're bidding on that card. And if you win that card by having the most pips um, at the end of that phase, then you will win that card and have the option to pay for it. Now, how do you tell whose dice uh, you know which dice are whose um so like they're all the same color so in a two-player game what we decided was i'll put my dice on this side of the card and my opponent would put his dice on this side of the card but let's say you do have a four-player game i guess you could do the corners but you know depending like what what if there's a card that is like really high in demand it's going to get crowded and i feel like dice could start getting like confused with the other cards next to them so that was a you know a minor issue i guess and probably the biggest issue i had with this Game. Um, so that is one thing to keep in mind. So this is how you go um, play the game. So at the beginning of each round you are uh, first you're going to have the morning market phase which is where you can sell any fish you have. So in the first round um, chances are that no one will have fish unless one of those tiles gives someone fish and they want to sell those fish. So you can sell the fish for fuel, for those goods tokens, those cubes, or for money. And then you begin with the preparations phase with the dice. So you'll each take six dice, roll them. And then you will have, you know, after each person has gotten six dice, then you have the obtain income phase. Oh yeah, and there are certain cards which will give you additional income. Um, I had one of those. Uh, I believe like this one says um, you for each yellow card during the income phase you can get um, four coins well not for each sorry if you have two yellow cards then you would get seven so there are some of these cards which also provide you you know with extra income then during the in, after the income phase that's when you have your get rewards phase so you're going to oh sorry before that my my bad um during the income phase as well you can turn in a die and get coins equal to the value of the pip that you just turned in um, then you have the get rewards phase so during this phase you on your player board will be arranging your dice from lowest to highest you're going to take your lowest die value and get a reward from here the interesting thing about this is that the lower the number the better because you can go for any number and higher so if you have a six your only reward option 
is to get five coins. However, if you have a one, you can basically do any of these. So if you have a d one, you can get a reward that is next to the one, two, three, four, or five, or six. But if you have a six, you can only get the reward that is next to the six. This is interesting because, you know, you want to get a lower, a low number when you're drafting dice for the reward. So you can pick which reward you want. Um, but then when it comes to bidding and turn order, you are going to have less pips maybe, and you might lose out on bidding and turn order as a result of that. So, you know, it kind of balances out there, which I like. Um, so then after the reward phase is when you set the turn order. So with the remaining dice, and at this point you are going to have one, two, three, four remaining dice, and you will count the total number of pips on those remaining dice to set turn order. Whoever will be going first then will get a interference token, which are worth negative points at the end of the game. The more interference tokens you have, the more negative points you will have at the end of the game. But one of your free actions is that you can spend five coins to remove an interference token. So now you go to the main action phase where players in turn order, now starting with the new first player, are going to use a die and take an action. So you have main actions, which are to bid on a card, to get some fish, I believe that one was get fish, take fish. So yeah, you will just turn in a die for one fish. The pips don't matter. Or you can uh, activate a hub. So again, a hub is when you have two cards next to each other and you have to use the exact value shown on, oops, wrong side. Um, one card is upside down. So you have to use the exact value shown on that die in order to activate that hub. Um, alternatively, there are some cards that allow you to use a die on the bottom portion as well. Um, let me see if I can find one here. So here's one where if you use a die here, um, then you can take one of the actions and it works similarly to the, um, I think it works similarly to the rewards part where the lower the number, the better, I believe. I cannot remember exactly if that works that same way. Um, and also, when you put these cards together on the bottom, your ship is going to be traveling along. So again, you're going to have a harbor, and you're going to have cards at the bottom of the harbor, and you'll see this like little water place. So you're going to have your ship moving along, and how far your ship moves along is how many points you will get at the end for where that ship is in your harbor, and Additionally, when you use a die on a certain card, if there is a ship there, I believe that earns you a free fish. Um, I think we did not realize that until the like last round of the game and we're like, oh crap, we've been missing out on fish, but that's something to keep in mind. So again, the free action, the main actions, and you can choose one of them with each die is to take fish, to uh, bid on a card, or to activate a hub or a card effect. Then you have any number a free actions that you can take, um, and I wonder if it's just one free action for each main action you do. It might be that. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh no, as many free actions as desired on your turn. So the free actions are that you can exchange fish, and again they're all summarized on the board. You can exchange fish for two coins or one fuel, and you need fuel to make your ship go forward. You can exchange three fish to take a discarded die from the main board. You can remove an interference tile. You can buy a new ship, but of course you'll want to buy a new harbor before you buy a new ship. So yeah, opening a new harbor is an action. Adjusting a die, you can spend a fuel to adjust a die, and you you need fuel to move your ship. Um, is that all the free actions? Uh, I believe so. Oh no, there's one more. Uh, G H. So the last one is move goods from the cabin to a port's cargo space. So there are certain cards that require cargo to be put on them. I did not have one of those, but my opponent did. Um, so that would of course earn him points, and that is one of those cards, I believe. So, um, and any resources you have at the left at the end of the game will be worth points. So if you don't use cargo or certain you know, fuel or something like that, it'll be left at the end of the game. So that is generally how the game is played. So again, four rounds, um, and then at the end of the main uh, phase, when everyone has spent their dice, used their dice, then you will resolve the bidding and see who wins the cards. 
and then you will prepare for the next round. And again, after round two, you will um, score the two mid-game objective tiles that were placed on the board. And then at the end of round four, you will score the last two objective tiles, and then you will do final scoring at the end of round four. So really, each round just has a couple of different phases in it. Um, and you know you can take one main action and as many free actions as you want, and then that's basically it. Um, so this game, I already talked about how I feel about the dice, and um, I don't know how you would fix that since you do take turns drafting them, so um, I don't know. I really... Oh, you know what would fix that? Actually, if you remember the game um, Coimbra, you could put dice into these little holders, right? So each player had these little dice holders that the dice would pop into that indicated it was their die that they used. So if you had that in this game, you could pop the dice into these dice holders and then place them onto the cards, and then you wouldn't have to worry about knowing which dice belong to whom. So that is one way to solve that. Of course, that would have increased the cost of this game and I do believe it's a very small publishing company like it's self-owned by this designer and artist um, so yeah but that is one way to solve that so maybe if someone you know can make dice holders that accommodate these dice or just some other dice because it doesn't really have to be these dice you can just buy special dice then that might solve it okay so the thing about this game is it took us quite a while to play it I think we were so involved in making sure that you know we did each step correctly and follow the order correctly that it did seem like a long game because of that but then it also felt like a really short game like at the end of round four we're like that's it like there's no more rounds like that was just too quick like we need more rounds we need to like really start getting a feel of how this engine is working that we've created in our harbor how we can really you know manipulate things to earn more things and sell more fish like it just felt like it was too short so it felt long because we were being very meticulous about making sure we looked at the rule book after each round to make sure we followed all the steps but then it felt too short at the very end. So I don't know what the advanced variant does. Maybe that does add in an extra round. Um, let's see, advanced variant. Um, no, I don't think it does. I don't think it adds in an extra round. It just adds in some new cards, I believe. Um, another issue we had with this game is, so I bought this used, so a player had, um, the previous owner had um, printed these out, which was very helpful. I do think it should have included player aids that um, described each card, which is what these printouts do, and the effects of that card, because there are so many different cards in this game, and the iconography for some of the symbols, you don't catch on that quickly, and... Um, we kept on needing to refer to the rule book. So then I realized that I had this sitting in the box, so then I handed my opponent this, and that was super helpful to have this printed out to be able to refer to this and not be, you know, keep on asking for the rule book since, but, you know, there's just one rule book. So, you know, it definitely should have included, I think, player aids with all the card descriptions for each player, but I guess you can print those out yourself or make copies of them like this person did. So that was very helpful. Um, as far as the theme is concerned, the game is about penguin watching. Did I feel like I was watching penguins? Not at all. Like, so for me, the theme and the mechanics, I don't know. Like, I think I was so involved in making sure that we followed each step correctly, that I wasn't absorbing the theme as we were playing. Like, I would look at the artwork and be like, oh, that is super pretty. But I guess I wasn't really, you know paying attention or being mindful to the fact whether each action I was taking corresponded to the theme. Um, but I did not feel like I was watching penguins. Like penguins didn't really come up. Like they're on the board, you know, um, the score marker is a penguin. But other than that, I did not feel like I was watching penguins. Like the game is about watching the most penguins, scoring the most penguin points, but just did not feel that way. So, um, but it's a very pretty game. The artwork is very unique. It's unlike artwork that I've seen in any other game and I'm definitely attracted to that because I get tired of seeing the same kind of style artwork over and over, which is, you know, I love the Micho's artwork, but like I'm just kind of tired of seeing games with a very similar art style over and over. So I like diversity in art 
in board games and this provides that like you know it's a very unique style of artwork that this art artist has so I really like that um, I definitely want to play again and try to pay more attention to the theme and see how the mechanics tie into the theme and see if I like it better after I play again and maybe at a higher player count maybe see if it's you know having it be a bit more competitive will make it more fun because you know there was only one instance where we both bid on the same card and also the losers who bid on a card and don't win that card they get to collect fish for each die that they had on that card so it's kind of like a consolation prize because otherwise you're just missing all these dice that you could have used for other actions um so yeah so you know that's my initial um feeling on the game and i hope to play it again so i can give follow-up thoughts because i think it's important to not make a final judgment on a game based on one play though i have done that for a board game in the past after one play of munchkin i decided one play was too much and i never ever want to play munchkin again but with something more you know substantial like this like a euro game i definitely want to give it more chances before i make up my mind about it but i hope the overview uh you know gave you a sense of how to play this game the rule book you know can be a little bit intimidating with the way it describes how many rounds and phases and everything there are but really just four rounds that's it at the end of second round do mid game scoring at the end of round four do end the uh, uh fourth round scoring and then final scoring and just you know you have your phases your market phase then your you know your preparations phase with the dice and then you're going to do your reward you're going to select a reward from your board um, and then you're going to do your income and then you're going to have the actual um, main phase action and then resolve bidding and that's basically it and don't forget that you can take as many free actions as you want so that is a pleasant journey to me though when i was doing research on this game i did see that he had created a card game based on this board game so i think it's a set collection game um, so I would be interested in playing that if I can get my hands on it just because maybe, you know, maybe it's more thematic than this. Who knows? I don't know. So I would like to see if I can find that game somehow. Um, so yeah, so that was this game. Then the next game I will talk about is... Let's talk about Stella Dixit Universe because I would like to be able to compare it to the old game. Um, so Stella Dixit Universe, let me just uh, bring up the information. Okay, Stella Dixit Universe is a 2021 game. Um, it is designed by Gerald Catios and Jean-Louis Rubira. It is for three to six players. The artist is Jerome Pellissier and the publisher is Lillibud. So um, this game is a bit different, of course, than the original Dixit. So in this game, you are going to have this board and you are going to have your own like tokens. So on the one side of the token, it will show a lantern lit up and on the other side, it will show the dark side. So you um, are going to have a row of five cards each next to each of these. So there's going to be three rows of five cards each. You are going to have a clue. So for example, let's, let me just pick one up randomly. So let's, let's suppose your clue for that round is mafia. So you are going to, on your own player board, and you're going to you know put your player board kind of in the same orientation as this main board so for example the moon is here so if you are sitting there you're going to have the moon in this direction and you are going to place an x on each card that you believe corresponds to that clue that can be associated with that clue mafia so you're going to put an x in each one and then after everyone has to, you know, put X's on their boards privately, you are going to ask each player how many X's they have on their board. That's where things start to get a little bit tricky. So if you have the highest number of X's and you are alone in having the highest number of X's, you will turn your thing to the dark side um, because it means you are extinguished. I can't remember what the exact word is that they used. Um, lights out in the dark you are in the dark there we go so you want to try to 
ideally guess the same number as someone else and not have the highest number and be alone with having the highest number because that can negatively impact your scoring uh, when you get to the scoring phase. So then starting with the first player in that round, and this will pass round after round, the first player is going to then point to a card that they had marked on their own board. If only one other person marked that card, then you will get the full three points. So you will fill in all three stars next to that card. If multiple people marked that card, then you will get only two stars and not the bonus star. If you were the only one who marked that card, you have fallen and you can no longer um, be the starting player and you can no longer get points for any other cards. So when you are going around in circles and um, around the group and picking a card and checking to see if anyone else has selected that card, you want to ideally pick a card that you are certain someone else had picked. And I, you know, if possible, that only one other person picked so that you can get the most amount of points because you don't want to fall. Once you fall, you will not be able to score additional points even if someone else picked a card that you had. They may be able to score additional points, but once you've fallen, you cannot score additional points. Um, so that is, you know, the bad part about falling. Um, Additionally, if you are in the dark, so when you score, if you fell while you're in the dark, you will have to remove a star from each card that was being scored. If you did not fall, then you will still get your full, full score. So being in the dark is a bit risky because if you fall, you will get less points, fewer points. Um, but if you did not fall, then, you know, it might actually do you some good. Who knows? Um, because if you had the most cards selected, you know, there's still a chance that you get a match with someone else because you know different players might have selected different cards so i think the scoring in this is more unique i like the scoring in this better than the original dixit of course the original dixit has to be scored in a different way because you're not like selecting a certain number of cards in the original dixit there you know each person is going to get a chance to give some kind of a clue and then each person is going to select a card from their hand and put a card down that they believe corresponds to that clue and then you have somewhat similar scoring you know, um, your, you know, your bunnies racing on a track. Um, so I like the scoring in this better. I think the scoring is more competitive. I often found myself like being really nervous, like, oh my God, like, I hope I didn't select the most number of cards. Or if I did, I hope I don't fall. Like I would be really nervous about which card I want to announce that I picked, you know, because I really didn't want to fall. So I found that there was more tension in this game, which I definitely liked better than the original Dixit. But as my friends have said, they missed the storytelling aspect and the clue giving aspect of the game. So that part was missing. Um, so, you know, and I asked on Twitter what people thought and it seems like the vast majority still prefer the original Dixit. I don't know. I like the competitiveness of this better, uh, though, you know, when I've taken that um, quiz that shows how you, you know, what kind of a board gamer you are, like theme, competitiveness, this, that, cooperative, I always get highly competitive. So I am super competitive. I'm not a sore loser <laughs> or I don't think I'm a sore winner either, but I do get excited when I win because it hardly ever happens. But I do like competition. And so I think for that reason, I like this game more than the original, just because I feel like it is more competitive. Um, again, you know, there are some issues with Dixit in general, like you, it's a game you enjoy more if you're playing with people that you know pretty well. Uh, by the way, I played a four player game of this. Um, so it always does, you know, you always can do better if you're playing with people you know really well and you can kind of figure out how their mind works and what kind of cards they might pick. Um, if you're playing with strangers, Dixit is not a game you're going to enjoy. I mean, this is not a game I would ever just bring to a random game night with people I don't know, like people I'm meeting for the first time. Definitely not. Um, another thing about this game that I absolutely like is that the original cards are so much better than the cards in the original Dixit. So this, these are the cards that this game came with and I like the artwork on these cards so much more than the cards in the original Dixit version. But by now I think I own four expansions. Um, there is not room for additional cards in this box. So if you want to play with expansion cards, you will have to keep them separately. It does come with a huge stack of clue cards. So I don't think you'll ever be, you know, you know, um, needing more of those. <laughs> there's a ton of those. Um, and yeah, and then there's these round tokens. So it, it, plays, it plays over four rounds. One thing I do not think was necessary, um, and I don't understand the point of this. So after round one, you will only um, 
um, put out cards for one new row. Then after round two, you'll do another row. Then after round three, you'll put out cards for the last row, um, like, you know, new cards. But I'm like, I think it would be more fun if you had new cards for every round. So I don't understand why they do it like that. I think maybe because they want some of the same cards from round to round because if a certain person explained why they thought a certain card could be something in a previous round for a previous clue, then that can give you some insight into what they feel about that card in subsequent rounds. So I think that is the reasoning behind having just one row change after the, each of the first three rounds. Um, but personally, I feel like I want to see more and more artwork. So I don't know. Um, but yeah, so that is Stella Dixit Universe, in case anyone was wondering how it is different from the original Dixit. There we go. The next game I played I am that I'm going to talk about is Nanga Parbat. Now this is actually a mountain in the country of Pakistan and Nanga means naked. So it actually means naked mountain. So I played a two player, well it's only a two player game so of course I only played a two player game of it. <laughs> so this came out in 2021 and it's designed by Steve Finn so it's published by Dr. Finn's Games. It is a really good game. I really, really liked it. And I think if you are looking for a solid two player game to add to your collection, this is one you definitely want to add to your collection. So each person is going to have a player board and there's a bunch of animals and a guide. So let me just take out some examples. Cute animals, by the way. Um, so like here, I don't know the names of the animals, but Snow Leopard. Okay, I know Snow Leopard and Red Panda. But the rest I'm not really sure about. I guess maybe this is a goat. A goat. Yeah. And I guess maybe this is another kind of goat. I don't know. Okay. Um, and then we have each player has their own tokens. So they have a certain number of campers. They have a certain number of tents, camps, and a certain number of scoring cubes. So at the beginning of each game, at the beginning of the game, you are going to have a random animal on each of these numbers and you are going to, the second player will get to place the guide, the yellow guide on one of the flags. What you are trying to do is you are trying to build camps and collect animals and score points. So if you are able to connect a group of uh, six camps, you can get seven points. And once someone scores that and puts their cube there, no one else can score that. So the more camps you can create, the more points you will get. And you can also trade in animals. So the, the middle row is for different animals. So they have to be distinct. So if you can trade in six distinct animals, you will get eight points if you are the first person, the only one to do that or you can trade in the same animals. And if you can trade in six same animals, you will get nine points. So each scoring um, spot has a room for only one cube in it. Um, and the game end trigger is once both players have either used up all of their hikers or all of their scoring cubes. So on your turn, what you're going to do is you are going to place your camper hiker, sorry, you are going to place your hiker on the mountain where the guide is. So wherever the guide is, you are going to remove an animal from one of those cubes, place your hiker on there and place the animal onto your board. Animals can give you special abilities. The snow leopard will allow you to switch the place of two adjacent hikers, which is very beneficial in the game. This brown animal will allow you to switch the place of an adjacent animal and hiker, also very beneficial. Um, this gray animal will allow you to switch the place of two animals. And this black animal will allow you to move the guide um, because normally you have to move the guide to a specific number and I'll get to that in a minute, but this one can allow you to move it anywhere. Um, and this one allows you to use this animal as a wild animal so it can count as any other animal for when you're trading in animals for points and the red panda if you get a red panda and you are equal to or less than in the score track than your opponent then you you will get a point so when you take an animal you place your hiker on the spot where you just took the animal from and then you're going to move the guide to that flag number so for example if i took animal number two from campsite from area number four, then I'm going to move the guide to area number two now because I took animal number two. 
if you start your turn and um, what was the rule? Oh yeah, sorry. If you end your turn and you just took an animal that is numbered in this with the same number in the section you're already in, then you just leave the guide there. Um, so again, this black um, animal can come in handy. Maybe it's a bull. I don't know what it is. Um, I don't think there's bulls on the mountains though, so I don't know what it is. Taper. I don't know. Um, so if you use the black animal, you can use it before you take your turn and that would allow you to move the guide elsewhere so that you can then place your hiker on a mountain that you want to, which I wish I had done because now that I'm thinking about it, that could have helped me. Well, I want anyway. But <laughs> So when you get hikers together in groups um, and you can see these dotted lines so hikers can connect to other sections. So for example, a hiker in one will count as adjacent to a hiker in four since it's connected by a white dotted line um, then you can turn in hikers for camps and that's how you will get the points for the camps so for each hiker you turn in you would place a camp in its spot so that's how you are going to try and score these now you have to be careful because of, co of course your opponent can come along and mess that up with an animal and you can trade in animals that you have used for their special abilities by the way once you use an animal special ability you put it down on the bottom half of the board but you can still trade in those animals if you want to for the trade action to get points that way it is a really good strategic game i really really loved it i thought it was so good and it really got me thinking about future moves, what my opponent might do, which animal he might go for, which section he wants to move the guy to, trying to anticipate, you know, far in advance, like, okay, if he does this, then that will allow me to get this animal, but then I would have to move the guide here, which might benefit him. So it really got my mind thinking so much and I really, really loved it. So I think it is such a great little strategic two player game and I highly recommend it. Um, I, you know, have no complaints about this. I really, really liked it and I'm definitely looking forward to playing it again. Um, the only thing I'm confused about, oh and there are secret objective cards that you can have as well which we did play with. Um, so we played with this um, so each player gets one at the beginning and for each camper on any section number that is in the yellow uh, of their card they will get one point and for each tent in that number on each you know section of the board they will get two points at the end. So we did play with the objective cards. Um, I'm just confused what this animal is because we got a bear in this bag and there was no mention of a bear in the rule book um, it's not listed on the board so i don't understand how i got a bear um, but i you know i did have all the correct animals um, for everything else i had enough and then the additional bear which i don't know what that is or <laughs> what it does um, but yeah really really good game and i love that this game takes place in pakistan because um, you know, I've explained my ancestry and connections to the Middle East and everything else before, but my parents were actually born in Pakistan. So, you know, it's cool to have a game that is set in that country. Um, so yeah, so that is Nanga Parbat and I highly recommend that you check it out. Um, the next game I will talk about is Love Letter Princess Princess. I actually did a one minute overview video of this. Um, it plays, you know, very similarly to the original Love Letter. Um, so let me just get the information about this. Um, so it's for two to six players. This edition came out in 2021. Um, the designer is Sen Seiji Kanai and the artist is Kay O'Neill and the publisher is like Oni Press Games and Renegade Games Studios. Um, so this one comes with some additional characters, um, different characters I should say because I have the original love letter right here so that I can just do a comparison for you guys because um, someone did actually ask me in the forums how this differs. So, you know, in the original as well, you have, you know, a lot of guards. So in this game, you also have a lot of guards. Um, you have six guards in total. So be, so in the original, um, you have six guards, which gives you the same ability. Um, in the original, you have two priests, which lets you look at a hand. In this one, you have two advisors, which lets you do that. Uh, in the original, you have a baron. There's two of them, which lets you compare hands. Um, you have a librarian in here, uh, two of them that lets you do that. In the original, you have the handmaid, which makes you immune to other cards until your next turn. In this game, it's the dragon that does that. In the original, you have two princes, not princess, but princes and two of them. So you can discard a hand and redraw and same in this game. Then in the original, you have two chancellors lets you draw and return two cards. In this game, it's the princesses that let you do that. 
there's two of them and if both princesses have been played um, in a round you and you have not been eliminated then you can gain an extra favor token at the end of that round um, in the original you have a king one of them lets you trade hands with someone else same in this version um, in the original you have a countess one of them which you must play if you have a king or a prince in this one it's a unicorn and same thing you must play it if you have a king or a prince and then in the original the princess which is number nine you are out of the round if you play or discard her in this one it's the ogre if you play or discard the ogre you're out of the round and I forgot to do number zero which is in both games as well a spy uh, gain a favor if no one else plays or discards a spy which works the same in this way so really it is like basically the same game the only differences are that you can gain a favor token from the princesses in this game so if someone else plays a princess um, as you have done and you guys remain in the game then you will get an additional favor token and of course the um, you know game end depends on the number of players um, but I'll just show you the artwork in this game and of course uh, one of the main differences is that these are tarot sized cards so I really like the artwork it's just really pretty um, the cards are just really really pretty I just really really love them so my intention is to just always play with this one because I do like that additional favor element in this game and that is the back of the cards and these are the originals which I'm sure almost every well, actually this is the remat this is a newer edition with more diversity in it um, so it's not actually the original original but and then the tokens in this one are these and in this one they are these pretty blue ones with yellow hearts on them um so yeah you know i don't know if you, this is your guys's experience but with love letter it gets to a point where you just want someone to win because the game can go on and on forever and so that was happening here so so we were just at one point i was just like someone please win already like so we can just end this game and go home <laughs> um that reminds me of one time when uh, i brought me and a couple of people we used to be really into lovecraft letter which is the lovecraftian version of love letter and in that you have insanity insanity tokens and it's crazy because you can win a round while I either insane or sane and so you need another a certain number of sane tokens or insane tokens to win and that game seriously goes on forever one time we played a six player game of Lovecraft letter that lasted two and a half hours. And at that game, we were just like, please God, someone win, just someone win so we can just go home. Like it took up our entire game night. I mean, it was hilarious, but, <laughs> but at the time we were maybe not enjoying it as much. Um, but yeah, so Lovecraft letter, you know, it's a, it's a good game. It's nice that it's, you know, like pocket size, you can carry it around and just bring it out. like. Um, when you can't really decide what else to play like so that's basically what happened at game night like um more you know people showed up than we had expected and so we were just like okay so what do we play because I didn't bring any games you know that were enough for like five or six people so we ended up playing Lovecraft Letter um what a love letter sorry not Lovecraft Letter so that is that game and finally the last game I played which I'm not going to take out because it's pretty big. I've actually shown it before. The Belgian Beers Race. It's back here. Um, so the Belgian Beers Race came out in 2021. It's for two to four players. Um, it's designed by Mikhail Botrio, um, an artist as Ammo, and it's published by BYR Games. Um, it is a really good racing game. And the last time I played it, the first time I played it, I played a three player game of it. And this time I played a four player game of it. And I actually won, which was really exciting. So, you know, as I said in my previous video, when, you know, the video in which I discussed this a long time ago, I think it was maybe back in October, um, I'll put a link to it in case you guys want to see some components. So I'll put a link to that video um, next to the name of the game down below um you know this this game is amazing i don't drink alcohol never have but you know i know what effects alcohol has on people so just knowing that i can basically see how thematic this game is and how well the mechanisms tie into the theme in this game it is seriously so good i mean you know if you get too intoxicated then you can't ride a bike you have no choice but to like take a bus you know there's certain things you can do um it's just so good uh you know hitchhiking is more risky um but can pay off if you want to hitchhike uh, it's just such a good game you're basically just going around you know Belgium trying to collect beer bottles, uh, you're trying to toast with other campers, you're trying to make it back to 
um, Brussels in time when the last day is ending. Um, and you know, you're going to get points for the most bottles that you have collected, for the most breweries you've visited, you know, for the number of breweries you've visited, for the number of, number of bottles you've collected, for the different scoring tracks are in your own board, because there are different types of breweries that give you some bonuses. Um, you know, you want to make sure that your intoxication level is not too high. A way to bring down your intoxication level is by eating cheese. Um, so there is cheese in the game as well, and certain locations allow you to buy and consume cheese. Such a good game. I really loved it. Um, the first time I played, I think I came in last place. This time I came in first place. So this time my strategy was to just get out there and visit as many breweries as I can. I was not as focused on buying beer bottles or drinking beer as much as I was uh, visiting as many breweries as possible in the first round. So basically my first round was almost entirely dedicated to just getting to the breweries and getting the bottles. And then in the second and third round is when I started maybe consuming some beer um, and started going a little bit up on the intoxication level track and um, going up on the uh, consumed beer track as well um, and yeah but I was the I think I was the only one who got all the bonuses for visiting all the special different kinds of breweries so there's uh, the breweries some of them have special shapes around them like stars hearts meeples or pentagon or was it hexagon and I am the one who visited all of the special ones and got all of the um, you know bonuses for that so I think that that definitely helped me to come really far ahead in points as well and I made it back to home base as well and there are objective cards and you know the objective cards can be really fun and competitive so you know if you pass a certain point in the day you have the option of destroying an objective card that someone might have their eye on which happened to me a number of times I would have my eye on an objective card and someone would see that I want it and destroy it so I couldn't get it and that happened to me like three or four times and so I was certain I was not going to win but I still won in the end but it's such a great game it's just we had so much fun playing it it's super thematic if you and you know if you're looking for a racing game this is a very strategic racing game I say that this is a racing game that is for you know gamers like it is a game for gamers a racing game for gamers um strategy gamers so there's definitely strategy in this game and again the theme ties in really well to the mechanisms and i absolutely love it and i highly recommend it um i don't know if the original publisher still has copies i got my copy actually from the gaming goat in las vegas tgg games so that was the last game i played um so now let me go into games that i am backing um so the campaign for hike ended i am backing the tabletop find it book i think it's only twenty dollars i think i thought it would just be fun to have um it's you know um it seems like a lot of um people got the book to uh preview it and you know it looks fun it's just you know someone a photographer who's taken a bunch of different components from board games and taking these really amazing photos of them and then you have clues and you try to find certain things in the images and you know as someone who loves board games I think it would just be fun to have a book that has photographs of different game components in it um, that have different themes um, so that looks like a lot of fun to me so I just got it even if I don't end up finding it very challenging um, because I do think I saw some comments somewhere that you know if people want like a where is waldo kind of book they would just go get micro macro crime city which you know i've discussed in a previous video which is great um but yeah so you know even if it doesn't turn out to be super challenging i think it would just be nice to you know make a nice coffee table book with all the pictures of the game components so i am backing that and that has 21 days to go and of course i'll include a link below um the next thing i am backing and i did discuss you know my feelings about mind management and Jay Cormier and Sen Fung Ling, Ling the Sen Fung Ling, Sen Fung Lim, and the issues that you know I have with them, with them, you know, basically, you know, buying into all the bullshit about me being dangerous and unfriending me and blocking me and all of that good stuff. Even though I played the game with Jay uh, like three times on Tabletopia and so supported him a lot. So during the original campaign of mind management, I was super vocal about the game, and people at that point in time, you know, really didn't show much interest in the game um, i'd be posting about it in groups and people would be like ah oh, the artwork doesn't appeal to me like, yeah whatever it's a hidden movement game i'm really into hidden movement games i really like letters from Whitechapel, but more than that i like a uh, whitehall mystery um so yeah so once my deluxe edition arrived i had actually put it away in a box and had no desire to play 
play it again or play it with the physical copy because of Jay and Sun Fung Lim and their actions towards me. So, um, but I am backing the new campaign just to get the additional cards, just because I am a completionist. And one day I do hope to play mind management um, when, you know, um, I feel like I, I won't care, you know, who designed it and I'll just be able to enjoy the game because, you know, of course it's gotten a lot of praise and the reason that there is a new campaign out for it again is because Shut Up and Shut Sit Down did a, you know, a really good review of it, I guess, and it increased the demand for this game. And so they decided to do a reprint and in order to do a reprint on Kickstarter, I guess you have to add some new elements. Um, so they added in a pack of cards, I think, that can be used, yes, Dobby, Dobby's crying, that can be used for new backers. Um, so so I am backing it just to get the additional cards. Um, so that I'm backing as well. And that ends on, let's see when that ends. So yeah, if you don't have the game mind management and you want it, because apparently everyone's saying it's like one of the best games of the last year, um, it has seven days to go. Um, so yeah, so I'm Then what else am I backing? I am backing, um, subsistence which yay i pronounced it correctly this time on the first time on the first try subsistence um so that has how many days to go let's see dobby um okay so that ends on february 16th so like five days to go and then i am backing finding anastasia which i mentioned in the last video as well and that has i think how many days to go february 15th so like four days so that is what I'm backing. Um, so let's go on to games that I have received. Um, so I received, when I was at PAX Unplugged, I had done, uh, stopped by a booth, the Blinks booth, and I had played Blinks. Um, it's these, I actually haven't opened this yet, so I can't show you exactly how it works. Um, I remember when this was first on Kickstarter, um, and they had actually reached out to me in the very beginning to see if I'd be interested. And at that point in time, I did not think it would be something I'd enjoy. But that changed once once I went to PAX Unplugged and I actually played it at the booth, like the demo booth. And yeah, it's a lot of fun. Like these are like programmable, like I don't know what they're called, things. And you can play games and it's basically it has like lights moving around and different kinds of challenges you can do. And just it increases in speed. It was a lot of fun when I played it. Um, but again, I can't like really describe it more than that right now, but they have a Kickstarter campaign coming up for a new Blinks um, pack. So they sent it to me so that I could play it and talk about it. And so the next time I hope I will have played it by then and that I can actually show you how it works. Um, another game that I received, um, which I will talk about is the expansion to Tang Garden. So Seasons is coming out on Kickstarter on February 22nd. And um, I was sent the base game from the publisher, Thundergriff Games. I had only just played it for the first time last two weeks ago, I think. Um, and that's when I discussed it in a video. There's like some, I think I have a cat hair on my lip. Um, yeah, so I don't have any expansions to this game. Okay, it's a hair. I don't have any expansions to this game. So this is my first expansion. Um, Thunder Griff always goes above and beyond with their prototypes, like really amazing. Um, you know, I know we discussed spot gloss and the environmental um, impact of board games. And even this prototype box has spot gloss on it. Um, so, you know, uh, oh well, uh, I, you know, can't do much about it. Um, but it comes with these bags. I don't know what goes in the bags yet. Some of these like uh, tokens, um, I don't know, a pretty envelope of some kind. Um, cards, which I have not yet opened. Um, these things, which I do not know what they are. I don't know what anything is because, you know, this is my first time actually opening it with you guys. <laughs> so, um, let's see what's in here. It looks like there's some miniatures. I think it might be like some more characters. Let's see. Do it carefully so I don't break the care. Oh no. You know what? They're just all taped up right now and I don't have scissors with me so I won't be able to show you right now. But when I, of course, make a, an overview video um, of this, you will be able to see the characters then. It comes with some scoring sheets and again, a lot for a prototype. Um, it comes with some punch boards and again I don't know what these are but it looks like these little squares pop out too so it looks like um, oh I think these are part of your own player board so I think you're gonna have a cube that sits on them like in the original base scheme um, and then it comes out comes with some other punch boards so let me just show you some of the boards so it comes with some more tiles um, 
from it looks like from the base game yeah it looks like some more tiles that oops some token just came out um so and then it comes with oh, this is so freaking pretty you guys it's got gold foil on it look at that that is so pretty um so that and then it looks like some of uh, are these upside down yes they're upside down my bad now these are so freaking pretty yes so i cannot wait to play tang garden with this expansion and then tell you guys all about it so I'm super excited that the publisher reached out to me to cover this. I'm just so excited. Um, yeah. So that is the other one of the games I received. And then the other game I received, I was like kind of like uh, standing by my um, email today, constantly hitting refresh to see if a certain game had arrived. It had not arrived, so I'll have to show you next week. But um, in the meantime, I can show you Mob. Apple, Big Apple. So, you know, having spoken about Steve Finn earlier today, this is a Steve Finn game published by TGG Games, and I had done a one minute overview video of this for its Kickstarter launch. It is a really good two player game. If you want a game that has like a little bit of a, maybe a deduction or a bluffing element, I would highly recommend this. Um, you know, it's an area control game, super fun. Like I have loved all of my plays of this game and the production copy is really nice. The board has all that gold foiling on it with the different areas and you are going to, you know, different areas have like different actions. I don't know. I think I'm think I might, might be mixing that up with the other board, um, but you know there's it's like a uh, I think the dice uh, it's, it's been a while since I've played it, but I think the dice you roll allow you to then decide where you're going to put your gangsters or whatever. Um, you have these chips, these really nice poker chips, which is where like the secret element comes in with like the numbers that you have on certain areas. Um, you've got your screen printed gangsters, which are super duper nice. Um, there's a bunch of them. Um, the deluxe edition, the Kickstarter edition, comes with these crates so that each player just has their own crate with all of their components in it. And then you have these crates that you are actually trying to collect in the game. Um, again, it's been a while since I've played it, so I cannot remember the exact way it's played, but I remember that there are special actions that you can take. Um, there's a DA track which affects the points in the end as well. So you're trying to get the DA, um, to, the district attorney, to be on the other player's side by the time the game finishes. But at the heart of this game, it's an area control game. So you're trying to get as many of your gangsters in the different areas of the city as possible. And, you know, there's different actions that you can take, like moving around gangsters, moving like, you know, your car. Um, but yeah, I remember when I played this game, I absolutely loved it so freaking much and I'm super excited to play it again. So yeah, like just looking at some of these actions, reading them aloud, change cars, drive, change cars and drive, redeploy mole, so you have a mole, you can move crates, you can influence the district attorney, you can add a crate, expose a mole, shoot or influence the DA. Yeah, so round, and then the, there's an end of round phase, which tells you what you can do at the very end of the round and then the end of the game but yeah super fun game so again you know Stephen so it's a two-player game um I wonder if he only does two-player games and that's it but yeah if you're looking for a good two-player game and you are into the whole 1920s like prohibition era thing um then definitely check out this game and as you guys know if you watch my videos I definitely am into the whole 1920s era even though you know I don't drink but I just you know find that era really fascinating so that was that. Um, wow, long video, guys. Okay, so I didn't get any questions this week, so I have no questions to talk about. Um, game night on Wednesday was really interesting because um, two of my friends and I stayed late and we were just were chatting for so long about things and um, you know, they know a little bit about the, my history in the board game industry and how certain people have bullied me and, you know, what kinds of stuff I've dealt with. And we just had some really interesting discussions about why people engage in mob behavior on Twitter and, you know, how the different parts of the brain, um, you know, how people act based on which part of their brain is currently active. Like, you know, you have the middle part or whatever the back part and then the front part you know so you have like your you know your rational thinking and your reasoning in the front but then you have your flight and 
flight, fight and flight part of the brain, which is not rational and doesn't, you know, want to accept reason when you try to reason with them. And that's, you know, the part of the brain that people are mostly acting with when they're acting out on Twitter and they're bullying others, they're, you know, engaging in this mob behavior. And so we had like such a long and thoughtful discussion about that. And just, you know, how to kind of address it if you do want to address it, but the best thing is to do, but the best thing to do is just basically ignore those people because the more attention you give to them, the more it will fuel them and they're not going to be coming to the rational, logical side anytime soon. Um, just a very interesting discussion because, you know, when I talk to my friends and they all see reason and they can all see that, you know, the way I've been treated by individuals and certain you know publishers in the board gaming industry is absolutely insane illogical makes no sense you know i'm a legal aid attorney i've been called elitist you know there's just so many things i've been called you know a bigot uh, you know you know i've been called so many things a turf even though i've helped trans people legally change their names on a voluntary basis like just you know logically what has happened makes no sense and but these people don't want to listen to logic right and it all happened you know you know it was a very good explanation of, like you know um example of that is when i went to universal studios and in 2021 and took off my mask and even though i made thread after thread outlining all the precautions that universal studios was taking all the precautions that i had taken logic was nowhere to be found in any of these people's twitter accounts like they were just in attack mode no you're a murderer you're this you're that there was no logic there was no being able to reason with these people they did not want to listen and reason facts did not matter um so you know they were very much just acting and thinking with the emotional part of their brain so we just had a really fascinating discussion about that and talked about you know different things in psychology and stuff it was just really good i just um you know, so I'm really thankful to my local gaming friends for always sticking by my side and knowing that I am not this horrible, dangerous, you know, person that, you know, some people on Twitter have made me out to be and certain publishers have bought into. Um, so it's nice to know that, you know, people who know me in person know truly what kind of a person I am and how passionate I am about certain causes and, you know, and things like that, and that I am not this bad person that, you know, the internet, some of the internet tries to make me out to be. Um, as far as Florida is concerned, I will not be going to Florida this month after all. So it turns out my sister's husband wanted to go as well. And my sister has three cats of her own. And then I have a cat, then my mom has a cat. And it just became this huge logistical nightmare about who's going to take care of all the cats because my mom actually wanted to go as well. So in the end, we decided that just my sister, my older sister and her husband are going to go. And then maybe me and my mom will take a trip to Florida um, next month um, and visit my sister then. I do need to make a trip to Florida, in fact, because I had, um, well, well, crazily, I had thought, um, so I got into Legos, I got into Harry Potter Legos and I, you know, my first Harry Potter Lego set that I ever bought was the Hogsmeade Village one. And then I really wanted the Diagon Alley one and it was sold out everywhere. And it came back into stock for like a minute or two on the Lego website during around Christmas time. But I was too late. Like as soon as I went to the Lego site and I wanted to buy it, it was already sold out again. So I went into panic mode. I'm like, oh my God, these Diagon Alley Legos are going to disappear. I'm never going to get my hands on them. And Diagon Alley is one of the things I love most about Harry Potter. Like I love spending time in Diagon Alley, whether I go to visit the studio tour in um, the UK or when I go to Universal Studios, which I've been to twice. Like I just absolutely love being in Diagon Alley. Um, so I ended up calling Lego stores in Florida to see if any of them had them in stock. And one of the stores had one in stock. So I paid for it over the phone and I had my sister go pick it up and I thought she would be able to bring it to me when she was coming home for winter break but it turns out the box is really big and heavy which I did not imagine I don't know why I didn't imagine that but I just did not imagine it would be a really big and heavy box so I actually need to go to Florida at some point to bring back my Legos um, so yeah so maybe next month hopefully we'll see um, but yeah but I do have an international trip planned um, in addition to the safari which got delayed from 2020 uh, me and my sisters had been planning to go to London in 2020 together um, you know people who 
who watch my interviews will know that I had lived in London for close to three years. So I have a lot of friends there and I like to go back and visit my friends in my favorite restaurants. So if I have any viewers from London, you know, I would love to arrange a meetup where we can all get together when I am there. It will probably be in June. So this is super advanced notice. Um, but yeah, if you are watching from the UK and you think you might, you know, like to um, have a meet up with me, uh, you know, just let me know in the comments. I think that would be super fun and I would love to arrange for something like that. And, you know, if you are in the UK, let me know where a good venue would be for us to do that and maybe play some board games um, because I would be totally willing to take time out of my schedule to do that. Um, so yeah, so I guess that is it since I don't have any questions to answer, but I do have a question for you guys. So when I was playing games with, um, you know, as I always do with my gaming buddies here locally, they always make jokes about how I go above and beyond with um, bagging my games. So I have purchased these high quality Plymore bags on Amazon. I have the small square sizes and then the rectangular sizes four by six. And you know, I know we talked a lot about waste and the environmental impact of board games. Um, you know, a lot of the bags that the board games come with are just so flimsy and just really bad quality. So I just take those and I recycle them and I use my heavy duty bags and I am super like, you know, obsessive about, you know, each component having its own bag and like I'm super organized in the way I keep my components like you know I'm very particular in the way I keep my components organized for every game like I have my own way of thinking about how to organize stuff so undoubtedly every single time I play a game with my friends they make some kind of a joke about how I have organized all my components into bags and you know the weird methodology that I use to do it the way I do it so I wanted to know if you guys have any things like that like are you particular about how you store your components in your board games? Do you go above and beyond like me? Are you a little bit crazy like me and actually spend money on plastic bags to have high quality plastic bags? Like what are, you know, I guess this would fall into upgrades. Like, can you consider plastic bags to be board game upgrades? I do, um, just because I like to feel like they are stored more securely. Um, so yeah, so plastic bags are definitely an upgrade that I do with almost every single board game I play. I have like a huge supply of these heavy duty bags, which I bought from Amazon, again, called Plymore. They are such good quality. I love them. Um, yeah, so let me know if you have any um, you know, quirks when it comes to upgrading your board games or anything you do in particular with your board games. And let me know in the comment what those quirks are, because who knows, maybe I might learn something new and start doing what you do as well. So yeah, so until next time, you, uh, you guys, I, for a second, I wasn't sure what I was going to say there. So yes, yeah, so until next time, you guys, bye.